Um, anyway, I, I wanted to talk about uh, infrared, and I don't know how many. I, it's interesting to see it's a great group. This is usually when I do these presentations, there's like 10 Koreans. And they come here to see if I'm also Korean, you know, because Park is the most common Korean name. But uh, uh, it's uh, it's good to see such a great group. I'm a I'm a longtime science nerd, okay, and uh, you know I grew up on uh, erector set. Anybody here have an erector set? Okay, yeah, um, and the Visible Man. Oh, that was my model, you know, outside of a couple of spacecrafts I made when I was a kid. But, you know, I've always collected science nerd tools, you know, like that. And I got, I bought the first pocket calculator that ever came out in, I don't know, 1970. It was called the Casio Mini. And it was about that big <laughs> and that thick. <laughs> And it only adds, subtract, multiply, and divide, and it only went to six digits. But man, was it cool to have that. <laughs> I can add, subtract, multiply, and divide without a calculator. My wife's a CPA. She can't do anything without her calculator. But then, of course, the next nerd tool I had to have was a scientific calculator. Now, probably everybody's got a scientific calculator now, uh, especially engineers, right? I liked it because it had a lot of extra buttons on it. I didn't know what they were for. Uh, I still have not figured out why I need to know what the square root of anything is. <laughs> but the calculator has a square root, the cube root button, and all that stuff too. So that's to, that's that's a sort of the background. But I started doing. Uh, working with this company, actually the company was formed officially in 2013, uh, but our parent company has been around for a hundred years and uh, basically in the mechanical insulation contracting business, especially contracting business, installing asbestos, then removing asbestos. <laughs> and, and we have a coatings company and a scaffold company and uh, and probably 50 branches in the US and Canada. So, but a few years ago, uh, one of our branches got a plan and spec bid for um, insulation project. And in that project, they asked for energy saving calculations related to insulation. And it's kind of, it's not a, it's kind of a funny concept that some would be concerned about how much energy they're going to save when it related to insulation. And, and, you know, none of us would ever think about buying a house that didn't have insulation in it. That'd be, that'd be stupid. That'd be something our, our guy would ask before we even signed the contract. But in industry, there's a lot of things that are not insulated. And so the, so in a new construction, Insulation is one of those things that sometimes gets value engineered out of a job. And so that doesn't make any sense to anybody that's in the energy business as being even halfway practical. But when they're trying to save money, you know, in initial construction, a lot of that stuff gets left out. And um, so our guy did the calculations, turned it in, and the customer said, how'd you do this? explained how he did the calculations. There's a DOE program that everybody in the world has that does those calculations, so it wasn't that difficult. But he says, good, I want you to do it again. And the guy says, why? He says, well, this is cool. <laughs> because there was, there was, everybody knows that there's energy savings involved in insulation, but not everybody knows how much. And when you do the calculations, you're everybody's like surprised <laughs> so anyway so we formed this business and uh because there were other people that wanted these calculations <laughs> and and those people also like to see pretty pictures <laughs> and they like to see a nice wonderful written report 
with illustrations and what better to illustrate than infrared. Now I was talking about nerd tools, okay. <laughs> nerd science tools, well infrared camera is the neatest, okay. <laughs> it is really a lot of fun. And uh, I don't know, how many people in here actually have an infrared camera? Okay, a lot, that's good. How many of you taken one of the FLIR courses and got a level one or a level two? Okay, that's good. The rest of you, I'm mad. <laughs> no, um, it's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, when I first got handed this $10,000 camera, um, I started using it. And people, somebody was saying, well, we're going to take a class. So, so we took a class. And when we took the class, I found out how much I've been doing wrong because it's very easy to make a mistake. Uh, it's very easy to misinterpret the images. And the infrared camera is, is not magic, but if you don't set it right, you don't get the right results. And if you don't know how to focus it or don't use the right color palette, you don't get the right results and you can make interpretations that are that are erroneous at best and uh i i uh, uh took the level two probably a year later and that was even more important it's pretty neat that you know you 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 really have to have level one in order to be able to operate the camera properly and the international protocol says you have to have level two in order to be able to interpret the images. And of course, when I took the class and, and the guys that work with me took the class, there was us and 10 electricians in there because that's what everybody uses a infrared camera is for is, is electrician stuff. And this picture here, there you can see um, a couple of photographs of uh, electrical issues on the on the left is it really on the left yeah on the left <laughs> there's a you can see there's a little it looks a little warmer than on the bottom than it does on the top and the question is why does it look warmer or for the cooler temperatures you can see uh, 78 degrees, 78.6 degrees on that scale. And the hottest temperature in that photograph is 127 degrees on the scale. So you can see there's a temperature differential there. Now everybody can see that temperature differential, but not everybody can say what that really means. <laughs> I'm not an electrician. I'll take that picture, I'll show it to an electrician, say, what does that mean? <laughs> And the electrician will either go, oh, or he'll say, oh, yeah, that's no big deal. Because <laughs> it, be it could be a circuit that's got a load on it that's better than the rest of them. It could be a loose connection, which is causing resistance when, and showing up as heat energy. So it could be anything. I'm not a, an electrician, so I can't make that interpretation. But I can bring it to the electrician's attention and say, hey, look at this. Uh, likewise, on the right there, you can see that uh, that is glowing white, and that's probably not something that's really good. <laughs> you know, when, when we walk around in the interior of buildings, we usually look at the exterior wall of a building with the infrared to see, you know, if there's insulation there or how much insulation is there and stuff like that. I have seen wires through the gypsum drywall that are glowing like that. In which case I would bring it to somebody's attention. <laughs> and it's, one, it's, it's funny, I, said, I showed the one guy, what, I said, that, I said you, got a, you got an issue with that circuit box over there. You need to have someone check that out. He goes, oh, I don't know, you know. So I showed it to his boss and his boss goes, holy crap. <laughs> You know, he could be over there and fix that right now. And uh, that's, you know, that's kind of uh, what, it ha what happens. We use, uh, we use infrared to find things 
in the dark. <laughs> okay, a lot of people use it, you, you know, use it for a hunting scope. You know, you can go out at night, you can see all the animals in the woods. That's a that's a fun thing, okay. And uh, uh, in a mechanical room or in an attic space, when there's no lights, you can see everything that's hot in the dark, like this uh, um, steam trap assembly, which is down by the floor. Out of sight, out of mind kind of thing. Uh, we use infrared to look at steam traps and determine whether they're leaking or not, whether they're they're actually blocked or, or flowing. Steam traps are tested in two typical ways, either with ultrasonic or with infrared. And with ultrasonic, you listen to the trap and you decide whether or not it's functioning properly based on sound you hear. In infrared, um, you look at the temperature differential between one side of the trap and the other. And uh, it's interesting it's interesting to um, talk to some of these maintenance guys who will say, I, I, was in a, I was in a food plant and I said to this maintenance guy, well, that trap over there has failed. And he says, no, 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 it's not failed. He said, uh, I said, well, yeah, I said, condensate's 258 degrees. <laughs> and he said, uh, oh, our condensate's always that temperature. You know, if condensate's 258 degrees, he's on another planet, okay? <laughs> condensate is, cannot be 258 degrees, unless it's under pressure, but condensate is not 258 degrees. I go, no, it's, it's steam. He says, no, it's not. I said, open that valve over there. He opens the valve, steam comes out. I said, look, there's steam coming out. He goes, it's always like that. <laughs> so... Uh, and he's the guy in charge, you know, he's, he's a maintenance guy, right? So it's interesting. It's interesting what you, what you see. Um, this photograph here, you can see it looks, it looks, this room looks very well insulated. You know, there's a lot of insulation there. And, and the, the reason I'm pointing this out is most of you people that have infrared cameras are walking around these rooms all the time. <laughs> And, and if you walk around in these rooms and you see these bright yellow, white objects in a dark room, you know there's opportunity. And, you know, I, I, all these guys that are electricians that are walking around with infrared cameras, I say, look at other things while you're there. <laughs> look around. This, this room, it looks like it's well insulated. But in infrared, all the things that are not insulated pop out. And that's really what we're trying to, what I'm trying to find when I go into a mechanical room or an attic space or a steam tunnel or something like that. Most of the time, people are aware of, of big valves and strainers and things like that. You see this one here, but up, up high in the ceiling, this uh, pressure reducing valve. And, you know, those have pretty, pretty quick paybacks too, you know, when you insulate these things. And um, how many of you seen the uh, insulation blankets that you that are like cloth and you wrap them around valves? You seen those? That's pretty common. You see those a lot. Um, those are expensive. They do, they fit on equipment that's odd shaped, you know, cause they're all made up specifically for those equipment. Um, but that's what typically gets done on a project. Those, those, big, those blankets get installed and, and people think that once those blankets are installed, they really got everything or they got everything that's, that's an opportunity. When in fact, all they've gotten is about half of the opportunity because the, the smaller half is the opportunity that is so small that you don't see it. Uh, you see the big stuff that's easy and that's obvious, but they don't make blankets for the little stuff. And, and so think about how many one inch valves are there in a project compared to how many 
eight inch valves there are. <laughs> okay. You have a hundred one inch valves for every one eight inch valve. And so I look at those, those, uh, those one inch valves. I look at it, it's kind of like a dripping faucet. Everybody knows that a faucet drips gallons of water, not drips. <laughs> And if you have a dripping faucet and it's dripping for a long period of time, you're wasting gallons of water and you want to fix that dripping faucet. But if you've got a thousand dripping faucets, imagine how much water you waste then. Well, in these, in these buildings, there's a thousand items dripping BTUs. <laughs> and those thousands of items dripped in BTUs, they add up into significant savings. Here's a picture of a, an infrared picture of a failed stream trap. And uh, you, know, you might notice uh, the difference between this picture and this picture. There's two different uh, infrared palettes. This one is called rainbow and it's got all the colors of the rainbow. And the one before, this is the iron pallet. And we, I use the iron pallet all the time. I think that it, for us, that's kind of our standard. In the infrared camera, you can take the infrared picture in any pallet you want, black and white, um, iron, rainbow. And in, in, the, in your office, in the software, you can change the palette. So, so if you like a lot of different colors, uh, you can use the rainbow palette. If you, you know, to be simple, sometimes I'll like convert it to black and white. If it's, if the temperature differentiations, differentiations are very stark, uh, sometimes the black and white and black and white is a lot easier to focus. <laughs> The rainbow is very, very difficult to focus. That's one of the things that, that I really had difficult with when I when I first started was was simply focusing, and um, you can see this steam trap that's that's failed. You can see the the uh, condensate temperature, and the steam temperature is two hundred and sixty six, and the condensate temperature is two hundred fifty one degrees. So you can see right away that that trap has failed. It's leaking steam. And of course, it's in a nice dark corner there too. So somebody probably wouldn't ever see it. Uh, the other thing that's really common that I see in, in buildings where they use hydronic heating uh, up in school systems a lot, I, I go into a school in the mechanical room and rarely do I see these pumps insulated or these valves insulated? And people will ask me, so, well, is there, is there opportunity in this school? And I say, what color are the pumps? If they know the answer to that question, I know there's opportunity because those pumps are not insulated. And, and it's, re it, it's really, it's typical. How many of you have been in a mechanic room and seen this picture here? Yeah. Okay. Everybody. The, um, uh, I went into the Pepsi Center in Denver, which is where they play uh, basketball or something there. Anyway, they have these same pumps, but they're like 10 inch <laughs> and none of them are insulated. And of course, when you take a picture in infrared, you, you, you that illustrates that even more. This, the under the, Interesting thing about, remember I said earlier about uh, insulation gets value engineered out of a project. Uh, also, there's a lot of things that go into a project that are never bid, never part of the bid. And anything that comes into the project that's shown on the drawings As a, as a, like, like a constant receiver tank is shown as a little square with a couple connectors <laughs> or a DA tank might be shown as a square with a, with a couple connections. 
because those equipment are heat exchanger, they come to the job on a skid from the factory. And because they're not detailed, there's no detailed drawings on the, the insulation contractor, we'll never bid those things. And so in, if they're ever going to get done, they're going to be an extra. Well, you know, they don't have extras on any of these projects anymore. So that's the kind of stuff we catch when we do our, when we do our audit. And, and, and of course, when you're doing, when you're doing commissioning or better retro commissioning, when you're doing commissioning, you're going to see all this stuff and, and you're going to say, Hey, you know, this is the, you know, your energy guys, we should be insulating these things. And, you know, insulation is one of those things that pays for itself, <laughs> lasts forever. The only time it doesn't goes bad is when somebody takes it off and throws it away. <laughs> Uh, it gets wet. <laughs> yeah, well, that happens. But, but it's not. It doesn't require maintenance like every other piece of equipment you put into a building. Um, this heat exchanger on the left, you can see the body of the heat exchanger came from the factory, all insulated, and uh, and everything leading up to it. There's no insulation on it. And uh, on the condensate receiver tank, <laughs> you see that the blind flanges and the washers there. You know why they're there? Because they're too damn hot for somebody to pick them up. <laughs> they put them down there and it's too hot, they can't pick them up anymore. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> these, when you, when, you, when you see the craziness involved in the insulation business, you know, neither one of these things are insulated, but it's boiled down to if it's painted, it doesn't get insulated. Okay, <laughs> that's crazy. But, but if you go into a mechanical room, look at those red pumps. If they're painted, they didn't get insulated. If it's painted, it doesn't get insulated. Well, the insulation guy, he doesn't always look at the drawings and he's not looking at what, he wants to avoid insulating anything he can avoid to insulate because he's trying to make extra money on the job. And he's working for the mechanical contractor who doesn't want to pay any extra money either. And so it, the stuff doesn't get done. But it makes good for a retrofit project. These two valves are hot water valves are out in the middle of a field at an Air Force base. And uh, they never had any insulation on them. And all the insulation leading up to the valves, it's all shot too. <laughs> But uh, it's out of sight, out of mind, and, and certainly neglected. These, uh, this stuff here, you can see they had a leak, and they the insulation was damaged, but they never put it back on again. You know, I did a, I did a uh, small project, sample project at, at Temple University, and... Uh, I tried for a long time to get a project with this, with the energy manager there, nice guy. And, uh, you know, he said, you know, we just put in our state of the art cogen plant. I, he said, would you like to see it? I go, yeah. <laughs> so I go in this cogen plant with my infrared and it lights up like, you know, like Christmas in there. And they had, they had two tanks in there. They were probably 12 feet tall and eight feet in diameter side by side, 185 degrees with no insulation on them. <laughs> and, and they had all the valves, none of the valve stems were insulated, the valve bonnets, none of the valve bonnets were insulated. And, uh, and, and of course he was shocked and uh, I was not surprised. And we did, a, we did a sample audit in one mechanical room in a library and they picked it because the people in the, the library were complaining their offices were too hot. So I went down this mechanical room and, and really found, I found a, a $20,000 project with about a four year payback. And uh, when I showed the data to the engineer, he said, this is 15% of our energy costs for this building. I go, no, it's not. He said, what do you mean? I said, it's more than that. 
because every one of those BTUs that I found you're losing in that room, you're paying to cool. So you're paying double, which is not unusual. And it turned, it turned out uh, in order to fix it, the maintenance guys had sprayed insulation on the ceiling, which didn't work. And after that, they cut a hole in the firewall to circulate all that heat in the whole rest of the basement. <laughs> and of course that didn't work. So they cut a hole in the ductwork to dump cold air into their room. <laughs> you know, all of those things, which, which, you know, but it's, it's crazy. Uh, this is a chill piping on the roof uh, glycol piping on the roof of a food plant in South Georgia. And, you know, people say, well, if it's cold, we don't have to worry about cold stuff. It's never going to have a payback. Payback on this was five years to insulate these valves. And they say, oh, well, who cares if it's dripping? You know, cold piping, it's always dripping if it doesn't get insulated. And so it's always insulated pretty good indoors because if they don't insulate it, it drips and it ruins the ceiling tile and lands on a piano and take it from a guy who's paid for a piano before. It's not fun. <laughs> and uh, the, the where that drip, you, Murphy's Law, where that drip lands is always land on the most expensive piece of equipment or the president's desk, one or the other. And either one of those things are bad. Um, chilled water pumps, you often see those not insulated. And uh, what, what this, this one here, I know you can tell in the, on, the, on the right, that pump's growing mold and not a good thing in a hospital uh, mechanical room to see uh, mold, black mold <laughs> on the pump. And, and of course, you can't put a blanket on that pump either on a chill water because the blankets don't have a vapor barrier. So we make special boxes for chill water pumps that are lined with rubber insulation. Now I was talking to an engineer, I was at the AEE uh, East Conference in Boston last month and this engineer, I showed him a little sample box. He goes, I'm trying to get people to make these things. He, everybody says, you can't buy them. I go, you can't buy them, you have to make them. <laughs> and he says, well, we don't know how to make them. <laughs> I said, I'll send you a specification. <laughs> Call me, I'll make all you want. <laughs> so, you know, it's it, it, the talent some of these times is just going. This is a chiller in a unheated, uncooled, unconditioned uh, mechanical room in the Gulf Coast states. <laughs> Where chillers come from, and they always come, they they always come from like Ohio or Minnesota or someplace like that, right? <laughs> How come they make them the same there that they make and they sell them in the Gulf Coast states and they make them the same? <laughs> I didn't ever figure that out. But every every chiller, every chiller, old chiller body I've seen in the Gulf Coast, they're all saturated with water because the vapor drive there is so strong, it just goes right through the insulation. And in this one here, you can see it's green <laughs> because it's not only saturated with water, but it's growing algae. Um, we use infrared too to uh, identify, identify areas and building envelope that are in need of remediation for exfiltration issues, infiltration, exfiltration. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to to look at this picture and say, hey, somebody ought to fill that hole in the wall. <laughs> you know, you don't need infrared to know there's a hole in the wall. <laughs> but, but, you know, you take that picture and people say, holy crap, there's a hole in the wall. Well, you know, this hole in the wall was probably uh, 15 feet in the air. And somebody took something out and didn't fix it, didn't replace it. And, uh, and, 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 you know, that's a place for the rodents to come in and did a project at a hospital, did a project at a hospital, just, a just an analysis at a hospital. And they were having trouble at this hospital because they had a, 
lot of negative uh, air pressure. And not being an HVAC guy, I don't know how to fix HVAC issues, balancing and all that stuff, which you guys do. But I do know that if there's holes in the building where the birds and the rats can get in, they will find those holes. And how do they find those holes? They follow the air. <laughs> they follow the air path. And this, this hospital had put in a, a new chill, chill water, it's a new chill water pipe, and they ran it around the outside of the building, and then they built a, uh, a, a roof and a soffit over this, you know, big 10-inch chill water pipe. And before they put the piping in, on that side of the hospital, they had lights, and they had to take those lights out. So, the, so the, in the contract, it said, take those lights out, and fill in the holes with light construction material. It was a brick building, so you fill in the holes with brick, right? But a contractor filled it with plywood. He didn't even use marine plywood, he just used regular plywood. So it didn't take long for the squirrels and the rats to get through that. <laughs> and that first floor of that hospital was so much unhappy material above the ceiling on the first floor. It was ridiculous. The, 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 uh, the humidity in the hospital was so bad, the stand pipes were sweating. Okay. Um, this picture here is, is a little more obvious. You see these pipes here, uh, uh, probably 20 feet in the air, 15, 20 feet in the air. You see the one pipe on the left. You can clearly in infrared see the heat coming out through that hole around that pipe. And uh, um, not a big temperature differential, but you know, the heat's 65 degrees coming out into 48 degree air. And uh, it, you, you need for infrared to work properly. The international protocol calls for 10 degrees C difference, okay? So about 18 degrees Fahrenheit difference. Sometimes it's hard to get that difference. <laughs> and, you know, if you're looking at a building in, in uh, Tennessee in the springtime, it's the same temperature inside as it is outside. If you're looking at that same building in Florida in January, it's the same temperature inside as it is outside. Hard to get infrared to work. We use smoke little smoke pens to for, for to find some of the leaks when we can't use infrared. But, but uh, you know, it's pretty easy to look at a door and see daylight underneath the door or between the two double doors. And, uh, you know, that doesn't take rocket scientists to figure, to figure out you got air leakage around the door. Infrared kind of um, shows that up. But I... You know, a lot of people, how many of you ever had a blower door test? Blower door test, good. Yeah, we do some blower door testing, not very much because it has such, it has such uh, square footage limitations, you know, on the bigger buildings, you got to have massive amount of blower doors to be able to do that testing. And, you know, like one blower door fan is between five and 8,000 square feet. So, uh, we don't do a lot of blower door testing. We use, uh, it's interesting. I have done some small buildings where I've just turned on the exhaust fan. Just turned on the kitchen exhaust fan or the bathroom exhaust fan and wait for a few minutes for it to draw negative pressure. And it will be enough to, to get the infrared to show up. You put a blower door in a, you know, in a building that's, 15,000 square feet, you're not going to get the 50 pascals negative pressure you need for the blower door test, but you are going to get some negative pressure. Problem with a lot of these buildings is you, you know, nobody wants to pay for that blower door testing too, because you got to make sure all the pilot lights are out. And if they have pilot lights and you got to make sure all the, um, um, drains are plugged <laughs> because it'll draw sewer gas and all that stuff. So it becomes kind of, kind of a, 
an issue. This is a, a gymnasium, school gymnasium, and you can see in it, you can see quite clearly that there's a infiltration issue at the head of the wall there. The other thing we're looking at is we're, you know, we're looking at these projects all on a basis of energy savings, not on a basis of building defects. Okay, when you're doing commissioning, you're looking at at building defects or things that are wrong with the building that you have to look at because you're commissioning the building. I'm, I find a lot of things wrong at the building that's never going to get fixed because they're never going to get fit into an energy project savings wise. But in a school, in a school, sometimes you'll see the most common area of infiltration in some of these buildings, older buildings is at the intersection of the roof and the wall. That, that is not always an accessible area. <laughs> in, in, the, in the case of a gymnasium, sometimes in a school, you can easily find that area. You can see it. And in infrared, you can see the, the infiltration there. Uh, but, but in a lot of areas, there's a structural steel, the structural steel member that is on the whole perimeter of that building and it covers up that joint. And I've seen people say, well, you know, those joints always leak, so we gotta fix it. Well, wait a minute. If you can't prove it's leaking, why would you spend money to fix it, number one? And number two, how are you gonna fix it if you can't see it, if it's behind the beam? And I've seen people, they squirt foam on top of that beam. Well, that never gets to the joint. <laughs> Because it's it's behind the beam, and, and so I, you know, the last company I worked for that made us do that actually sold the foam. So, you know, <laughs> but I don't think it ever paid for the <laughs> the energy savings that they got ever paid for. The key to uh, the key to all of the work that we do is is justifying the work based on the calculations <laughs> and and which is it's it's different and a little bit different than what you guys do commissioning wise but everything that everything that we suggest to the customer that be that has to be done we have to justify it with energy savings and so a lot of the stuff that we find defects we find we separate out because they can't be done fixed with energy savings, but the customer likes to know about it anyway. And so he fixes them anyway, you know, like loose hanging wires out of an electrical box or the pipe sticking out of the ground that somebody can trip over. So the, the key to, to doing any of this stuff is, is doing the calculations and, and uh, a lot of times there, you know, like in infiltration, we add, we use Ashley crack method, uh, which is the most common method. And we use the blower door testing and we use the, the pens, the smoke pens. But the, but the, the calculations are based on, uh, on the Ashley crack method. And of course, in, if in the case of insulation, it's all about R value and, and stuff like that. But it's interesting when you show someone you have a hole in the side of your building equivalent to a hole you could drive a car through. <laughs> you know, when you add up all the cracks in their building and, and you got an opening that's a cumulative opening that's four feet by eight feet. You, you know, the customer's like blown away. How could there be that big a hole in my building? Well, you know, when you add it all up, it's there. And, uh, and the, the mechanical insulation calculations are done based on the 3E plus. How many of you have seen that program, 3E plus? Yeah, a few of you, that's, yeah, that's the most common program. We use that and we kind of put it on steroids because it's a very cumbersome program to use. Uh, but you can see here, uh, this is a, a small project with a simple payback of, 2.39 years. That's one of the best I've seen. But you see there, it's it's 31,000 in annual energy savings. And most of these are just a few mechanical rooms. We did a project in um, 
in Maryland, the energy engineer did not think there was opportunity for insulation. And uh, one of the reasons he didn't think there was opportunity is that entity had just spent a million dollars on removable insulation blankets. We found a $1.7 million project with a four-year payback. And that's and the energy engineer didn't think there was any opportunity. Did a project, um, did a project down in Florida where they the UNESCO had done an energy, complete energy project at a hospital. After they were all done, we got an opportunity to go back and look at that same hospital and found 50,000 in savings related to insulation that they missed. And they had put insulation blankets on everything they could put a blanket on. So it's, it's, uh, it, and it's all based on, you know, it's the data, <laughs> like uh, uh, everybody knows who Deming is. A lot of people know who Deming is. You know, you collect the data, you can make good decisions. Anything else is uh, snake law. <laughs> so that's it. Thank you.